Thank you. I guess uh, I spent uh, a lot of the last few years doing stand-up, but never in a place designed for it. Okay, who builds a skyscraper without drawing blueprints? Well, uh, you may realize I'm not here talking about skyscrapers. That's a metaphor. Uh, the metaphor is software is like a building, and specifications are like blueprints. And it's a useful metaphor, but remember, it's just a metaphor. So, you know, if you think it's broken, then, you know, if you think I'm saying something that's all wet, well, argue with what I'm saying, don't argue with the metaphor. Now, there are different kinds of software and different kinds of buildings, you know. There's some very simple code that, you know, is analogous to a bungalow. And for that kind of code, you write short informal specs, which are analogous to sort of simple blueprints or maybe even just design sketches that an architect might make. Uh, that's a topic for another talk. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, skyscrapers or their software analog, which are complex distributed concurrent systems, not just software, uh, hardware analogs as well. Uh, those require complex specs, just like skyscrapers require detailed blueprints. Uh, and we need, need tools to handle uh, that kind of complexity. And to build tools uh, to, to help us with our specifications, they need to be formal. They need to be written in some precisely defined language. So, uh, I think you probably all know why formal methods don't work in industry. Uh, they're too hard to learn. Uh, formal methods lead to inefficient implementations. You know, the, it's for all the stuff that's nice and, you know, in theory, but you, you have to really, really get the performance out, uh, you know, they don't work. Uh, they increase the time to market. Uh, and even if you want to use them, your managers won't let you. So, uh, have a little story about what happens when people really try using formal methods. And this story begins with Pamela Zave, who is a researcher at uh, Bell Labs, if it's still called Bell Labs, I'm not sure. Uh, she wrote this paper in uh, 2010, uh, it's the case of Cord. Uh, how many of you have heard of Cord? Uh, oh, some. Uh, it's uh, was denounced in this paper, a scalable peer-to-peer -peer lookup service for internet applications, a uh, half dozen authors, uh, was published in SIGCOM in 2001 and then the uh, journal version uh, two years later. And this is a very popular paper, at least in academic circles. It's won an award, it's got uh, you know, thousands of citations. Uh, now, a little disclaimer here. This is a story about what Pamela wrote and its effect. I do not claim that what she wrote is correct. Uh, now, what the paper claims, and I'm quoting from some slides of hers that were on the web, uh, claims three features that distinguish CORD from many peer-to-peer -peer lookup protocols are its simplicity, provable correctness, and provable performance. What Zave reported, again quoting from her slides, even with simple bugs fixed and optimistic assumptions about atomicity, the original protocol is not correct. Of the seven properties claimed invariant of the original version, not one is actually an invariant. Some, or maybe all of the many papers analyzing CORD, are based on false assumptions about how the protocol works. Due to sloppy, non-existent documentation, it's not possible to tell which version an implementation uh, is actually implementing, although no known version is correct. Uh, she later devised a version that she claims is correct. Uh, and aside, the authors of the CORD paper do not agree with what Pamela wrote, uh, they claim that the algorithm they published is correct, although its description may have been somewhat ambiguous, uh, but they claim that they basically got it correct. 
Uh, pastry. Pastry is an algorithm that addresses the same problem as chord, uh, distributed peer-to-peer, -peer, key value uh, lookup uh, store. Um, and this is what Stefan Mertz says about pastry. Now, a non-disclaimer, I've worked with Stefan for 25 years, and I believe what he says. Uh, he wrote, uh, we found no statement of correctness properties in the published papers on pastry. We asked an author who sent us a property, and the published version, and a later unpublished version, which was supposed to correct some problems with the original, neither of them satisfied this property. Uh, and the free pastry implementation, uh, which I believe is an open source implementation of uh, pastry, has similar problems. End of aside. Now, engineers don't care about correctness. You know, programs are basically pretty simple. Users don't mind a few bugs. And any bugs not found by testing aren't you know, really likely to occur. Well, engineers didn't care about correctness. Clouds are not simple. They're complex distributed concurrent systems. They're really big skyscrapers. Users do mind bugs. Now, companies are putting, you know, betting their business on the, on, uh, by putting their data on the cloud. And a bug can cause their data to be unavailable, lost, corrupted. No matter how many copies you have. Uh, you know, if you've got a basic bug, just putting some extra copies around is not going to buy you reliability. And any bugs not found by testing will occur. Systems are big, with lots of concurrent operations. Uh, one cloud system that I know of and I'll mention later as something like, you know, a gazillion uh, uh, objects and half a gazillion requests per second. Uh, and in a system like that, when you're banging it so heavily, anything that can go wrong eventually will go wrong. Now, <clears throat> the story moves to Seattle. Uh, Chris Newcomb, who is a software engineer at Amazon, actually was a software engineer at Amazon, uh, and I will quote from a draft of a paper by uh, Chris Newcomb and half dozen other authors, all of whom were at Amazon at one time. I think one or two of the authors, as well as uh, in addition to Chris, have since moved on. So use of formal methods at Amazon Web Services. Uh, the paper will appear in communications of the ACM. Uh, how it started, as Chris, oh, as the authors wrote, Chris's dissatisfaction with the quality of several distributed systems he had designed and reviewed. Uh, the systems were considered very successful, yet bugs and operational problems still remained. Uh, he did not initially consider formal methods due to the strongly pervasive, strong pervasive view that they are only suitable for tiny problems and give very low return on investment. But everybody knows about for, you know, trying to use formal methods in industry. Evidence that they work on real systems were, were provided in the CORD paper by Zave. Uh, she used a language called Alloy. And her success motivated Chris to perform an evaluation of Alloy. Uh, they liked, he liked many characteristics of the Alloy language. Uh, but he found that Alloy was not expressive enough for many of the things that they needed to do. He also found that Alloy's tools didn't scale to large problems uh, to, of the class that they uh, were faced with. Uh, now, in a side, Alloy was developed uh, at MIT by Daniel Jackson. It was explicitly not designed for Amazon's class of problems. Uh, so the fact that it you know, worked pretty, pretty well is actually you know, not a mark. You know, the fact that it didn't work is a mark against Alloy. The fact that it worked pretty well is, uh, says that Alloy is a you know, good system. 
Uh, Chris looked for a language with richer constructs for describing system states. And eventually, he found uh, a TLA plus specification in a paper on the Paxos consensus algorithm. Uh, this gave us some confidence that TLA plus worked for real uh, world systems. And then he found some other examples and wrote some specs, some TLA plus specs. It convinced him that it would work for their problems. Spreading the word. Chris tried to persuade colleagues to adopt TLA+. However, engineers have almost no spare time for such things unless compelled by need, especially when they know that formal methods don't work. Uh, fortunately, a need was about to arise. DynamoDB, uh, I think, well, I'm not sure if that was the system with the numbers I, I gave on the other slide. Uh, but that was an Amazon system. Uh, scalable, high-performance system replicates customer data across multiple data centers while promising strong consistency. Not eventual consistency one of these days, but strong consistency. Uh, replication and fault tolerance mechanisms were created by Tim Rath. Uh, Tim performed extensive fault injection testing and wrote detailed informal proofs of correctness. He learned TLA plus and wrote a detailed specification of these components in a couple of weeks. The model checker found a bug that could lead to losing data. The bug had passed unnoticed through extensive design review, code reviews, and testing. The model checker later found two bugs in other algorithms inside of DynamoDB, again, both serious and subtle. Now, some of you may be saying, oh, just three bugs? My programs have thousands of bugs. <laughs> well, these were not your ordinary bugs. These are fundamental design errors. They were unlikely to be found by testing. Fixing them after implementation would have been expensive and required redesign and extensive reprogramming. I said requires. Just because it requires it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get them. And in fact, the temptation is to patch. And patchly, patching usually fixes one case but leaves the basic bug there uh, to bite you again. And often it introduces new bugs. Tim says that using TLA plus from the start would likely have improved time to market as well as improving quality. So remember, formal methods increase time to market, not when you have to spend the time to, tr to eliminate bugs. Uh, the virus spread, these are some of the first uses. I will take a drink of water, I'll let you uh, browse the slide. I've got plenty of time, you can browse a little further. I can wait till the lips stop uh, moving. Okay, the Amazon experience. Again, this is quoting from the paper. In industry, formal methods have a reputation of requiring a huge amount of training and effort to verify a tiny piece of relatively straightforward code. Our experience with TLA Plus has shown that perception to be quite wrong. So far, we have used TLA Plus on six large complex real world systems. That's from the paper. The last I heard from Tim, uh, the number was 14 uh, systems. In every case, TLA Plus has added significant value, either finding subtle bugs that we are sure we would not have found by other means or giving us enough understanding and confidence to make aggressive performance optimizations, optimizations without sacrificing correctness. Uh, these are optimizations that they wouldn't have dared make uh, if they had not had the TLA plus specification and the tools to, uh, to check it to give them that confidence. And by the way, that's exactly the same thing I've heard from people at Intel who use uh, TLA+. 
So remember, formal methods lead to inefficient implementations. On the contrary, careful designers, it allows them to make things more efficient than they would otherwise have dared. So they write, we now have seven teams using TLA+. Tim tells me the number, you know, as of last month was nine. Uh, with encouragement from senior management and technical leadership. Remember, managers won't let engineers for use formal methods. They will when they see that they work. Engineers from entry level to principal have been able to learn TLA Plus from scratch and get useful results in two to three weeks. In some cases, just in their personal time on weekends, and evenings and without help or training. Remember, formal methods are too hard to learn. They're not. Other users of TLA Plus, Intel, they've used it for about a, a dozen years. Uh, now used by a few groups. Uh, my inform informants at Intel have left Intel, so I don't really know what they're doing now. The one use that I did know about was a group designing multiprocessor memories. Uh, the first thing they wrote was a TLA plus spec. They would work for about a month designing on the whiteboard. Then the first thing they would actually write is a TLA plus spec. Uh, let me give you some more details. They would then spend, uh, you know, model check the hell out of it. We'll talk about model checking a little later. Uh, and when they were convinced that it was correct, then they would start maybe trying to do optimizations, maybe writing the specification down at a little lower level to reveal more details of what they're doing and check them. Uh, then they would give the uh, TLA plus spec to the uh, uh, next level who wrote the RTL, uh, Register Transfer Language Code. And then at one point I learned that the people writing the RTL code said, hey, gee, this TLA plus stuff is neat. Uh, and they wanted to do another level of design of refinement at the TLA plus level before going into the RTL code. Uh, they, I know they, you know, they did start doing that. Whether they're still doing it now, I don't know. Uh, Microsoft. Uh, there have been a number of TLA plus success stories. The one I like uh, is Chuck Thacker uh, had an, an intern uh, write a spec of the Xbox 360 memory as a, a summer project. Uh, before he even had completed, before he'd even gotten far enough in writing the spec to be able to you know, check it, he found a bug and this design, and the chip was designed by IBM. So Chuck sent the, uh, the counter example, the, the, the behavior that demonstrated the spec to the IBM engineers. And we waited and waited, and a couple of weeks later, uh, they came back and said that this was indeed a bug. If it had not been caught, every Xbox, uh, Xbox 360, uh, would have hung after the first time somebody had used it for uh, four hours straight. Uh, that bug would not have been caught by IBM. Uh, the uses I know have uh, at Microsoft have all been aided by Microsoft research researchers TLA plus has not become a standard tool yet in a product group. So what is TLA plus? Uh, Chris New uh, Newcomb likes to call it exhaustively executable pseudocode. And I think that's a, you know, that's a nice name. It gives an engineer a nice warm fuzzy feeling. Oh, it's just pseudocode. What I say is it's math and that scares the hell out of programmers, engineers, even computer scientists. Math, oh, horrible. Ah. Well, it's not something to be afraid of. Well, why math? Because math is what real engineers use. And software engineers ought to be acting like real engineers. <laughs> Engineering is applied science. And what science does is it makes mathematical models of reality. For example, one of the first, perhaps the, the first real science was astronomy. 
Uh, and the reality is, you know, planets are complicated things. They have mountains, oceans, atmosphere, and all that sort of stuff. And the initial model uh, of, that astronomers use is a planet is a point mass with position and momentum. Now, a model is an abstraction created for a purpose. So it ignores irrelevant details and allows you to concentrate on the details you're interested in or the details that you choose to be interested in or the, the details where you think it's worth spending your time being interested in because they're the places where errors are, are going to be likely, you know, more serious, more expensive, harder to find, harder to fix, whatever. So in the point mass model, it's really good for predicting a planet's position. It sucks for trying to predict the planet's weather. Uh, so how TLA plus models software systems? A system execution is represented by a behavior. A behavior is a sequence of states. A state is an assignment of values to variables. So a system is modeled by a set of behaviors. The set of all behaviors that represent possible executions. This is the whole basis of the model. Really simple. Uh, you want your formal model, you want your formalism to be really simple because systems are complex enough you know, and you don't want to add another layer of complexity in your formalism to, that you also have to cope with at the same time. So as an example, I don't have a, uh, time to give you any kind of uh, you know, even vaguely realistic example. Uh, so I'll use Euclid's algorithm, my favorite toy example which, as I hope you all know, computes the greatest common, common den denominator of integers m and n by using two variables, x and y, it initializes x to m and y to n, and then you keep, you keep subtracting the smaller of x and y from the larger, and you stop when x equals y, and that value then equals the GCD. So for m equals 12 and n equals 18, there's one behavior, the first state, uh, remember, a state is an assignment of values to variables. There are two variables. The first state assigns 12 to x and 18 to y. The next state, where well, you get by subtracting the smaller you know, x from y, uh, so x, second state, x is 12 and y is 6. And the third state, x equals 6, you subtract y from x, x equals 6, y equals 6. We stop when x equals y, and in fact, uh, by my computations, 6 is the GCD of 12 and 18. It works. Uh, so how do we describe the set of behaviors? You said a, a system is described by a set of behaviors, so how do we describe those behaviors? Uh, with two things. The set of possible initial states and a next state relation that describes all possible successor states of any state. Now, they specify safety. A safety property specifies what may not happen. A more precisely, a safety property is one that, if it's violated, you can look at a specific point in the execution and say, here's where it was violated. Now, here's the something bad that wasn't supposed to happen uh, that happened. For example, a safety property is the system should not produce the wrong answer. Well, if it produces the wrong answer, you can point to some place in the execution and say, that's where it did it. Now, we also need to specify liveness, which, you know, something that must happen, because systems satisfy their safety properties by doing nothing, because if you don't do anything, then you can't do anything wrong. Uh, an example must eventually produce the right answer. Uh, and that's something that you have to look at the entire behavior to see whether that, sit, that property is violated because you can't tell that it hasn't done something unless you have the entire infinite behavior at your disposal to see that it hasn't done that. Uh, now, I don't have time to explain how to uh, specify liveness. I'll say a little bit about it later. Uh, I, you know, I have to, I'll stick with safety. Uh, safety properties in practice are 
give you the most bang for your buck in uh, specification uh, in terms of you know, the benefit you get in terms, in terms of <laughs> errors that you can find uh, with respect to the amount of time you, you put into it. Uh, so how do we specify these two things, a set of possible initial states and the next state relation? Well, we do it like scientists, by mathematical formulas. So Euclid's algorithm, remember this is Euclid's algorithm. So the set of initial possible states, well, it's specified by a formula that I like to call a net. Uh, and if we initialize x to m and y to n, that means the initial state is specified by this formula, x equals m and y equals n. And this funny symbol mean, just means is defined to equal. And it's typed this way in TLA+. And this symbol, I hope you all seen it somewhere along the line. It's, you know, logical and, you know, it's written this way in C and Java and probably some other way in your favorite language. Uh, and this is how it's typed in TLA+. And that expresses the fact that we initialize it x to m and y to n. Now, the second, those two things, are specified by uh, a next state relation describing all possible successor states of any state. So, by, it's, we'll get, we'll specify it by a formula that I like to call next. And in that formula, unprimed variables are talking about the current state, and prime variables are describing the next state. Remember, we're talking about a relation that describes all possible next states for a given state, and so and this would be a formula in which unprime variables describe the current state, and prime variables describe the next state. So we we'll call it next, and it's going to be the logical or, the disjunction of two formulas meaning there are two possibilities. The one possibility when x is greater than y, and the other possibility is when y is greater than x. So if x is greater than y, then we keep subtracting the smaller of x and y from the larger. Well, that means the new value of x, x prime, is equal to its old value of x minus the old value of y, and the new value of y is equal to the old value of y. So that tells you what the next state relation, the relation is for the case when x is greater than y. And if y is greater than x, the obvious uh, analogous thing, you subtract uh, x from y, and you get this formula. And you stop when x equals y. Well, y. Well, if x equals y, then x greater than y and y greater than x are both false. Well, false and anything equals false. So these two things equal false, and false or false equals false. So the next state relation equals false when x equals y. Uh, so that means there is no possible next state. You can't find values of x and x prime that could make false true. Uh, or that is, you can't find a value of x prime that will make next true because when x equals y, next is always equal to false, which means there's no next state. So, this is, uh, this is Euclid's algorithm in mathematics. Uh, this is, uh, in TLA+, plus, uh, you know, it's a language, so it adds a little bit of uh, boilerplate. You'd have to declare your constants and your variables. Uh, you extend the integers, that's a integers a standard module that imports the definition of things like greater than and minus, and you wrap it around and call it a module. Uh, and this is the way it's typed in ASCII. Notice that we've specified Euclid's algorithm with two mathematical formulas. This is simple, ordinary math. Uh, not some weird computer scientist math. What could be more elegant? I mean, just how beautiful, I mean, just think how beautiful, just ordinary math when we've specified an algorithm. 
Well, what could be more, you know, there's these two formulas. What could be more elegant? Well, we'll do it with one formula. Uh, and to do that, we introduced TLA, the temporal logic of actions. Uh, and the TLA formula combines these initial predicate and next state relations in this formula. Uh, and the, uh, don't worry about you know, exactly what it means. It's temporal logic. And temporal logic isn't ordinary logic. It's one of those weird types of logic. But it's just a little weird. I mean, it was invented by mathematicians, not computer scientists, so it's not too weird. Uh, and it turns out that if you want to reason about liveness, you want to talk about, describe liveness, temporal logic is the best you know, way of doing it that anybody has found. Uh, uh, to add liveness, uh, with Euclid's algorithm, we write, the formula actually looks this way. This WF stands for weak fairness. By the way, that box uh, in uh, the, uh, in the formula, it's the, that's the only temporal operator in TLA+. Uh, WF, weak fairness, is expressed in terms of it. Uh, and this part, the safety part of all specs, no matter what, you know, specifying Euclid's algorithm or, uh, you know, some Intel chip, this is what it looks like, initial condition and box next state relation, and that's sub the tuple of all the variables. There are just two variables, x and y, in this uh, formula, but you know, there may be 17 in the larger one, but that's exactly what the spec. So if you're just dealing with safety, temporal logic just comes in when you, when, you, know, you just have the init and the next state relation, and then you just paste them together with the, into this one formula. Uh, you only, temporal logic really only comes into play when you're dealing with liveness. And for any sequential algorithm, this is what it's going to look like. Uh, for concurrent algorithms, it's usually the conjunction of fairness formulas for you know, different sub-actions of the uh, different parts of the next state relation. But I don't have time to, to go into that. Uh, but occasionally, you actually may need arbitrary temporal logic formulas. Now, it's not rocket science, but you know, I just don't have time to discuss it. Uh, so, what do real TLA plus specs look like? Now, I don't have time to explain a non-trivial example, but I can at least flash you know, something up on the screen to give you an eye, a hint of, of what they're like. Uh, these two examples, Paxos, which I think people here have heard of, uh, and Wildfire, which is a simplified version of uh, a uh, an alpha chip uh, and the mult of the uh, multiprocessor cache coherence algorithm for that chip. Uh, and it's a simplified version. So for Paxos, this is the initial predicate. Uh, you know, things to notice. Oh, this funny bulleted list of conjunctions notation. Uh, computer scientists somehow you know, seem to hate it, but Engineers love it. The, the idea is that, yet, that it uses indentation to avoid parentheses and really makes formulas easier to read. Uh, uh, very useful for complex formulas. Uh, this is uh, TLA plus notation for this thing. It's for the, it describes the array F, which I'll call, say, call F, just give it a name. Uh, with an index set, set of acceptors, such that for every acceptor A, F of A equals minus one. So this is how you write that array, you know, indexed by acceptors with all the elements minus one. But that's talking like a programmer. We want to talk like a mathematician. And uh, mathematician, you know, a function is what is the mathematical thing that corresponds to uh, what computer scientists, you know, programmers call arrays, and the index set is called the domain by uh, mathematicians. So there are four variables. The next state relation uh, has is defined in terms of these four actions: phase one a, phase two a, etc. Uh, those are subformulas that 
are defined separately. This is the most complicated one, the one phase 2AB. Uh, and there uses some notation like subset of something that's the set of all subsets of this particular set. Uh, and there's another action send defined in here uh, that actually describes the uh, again, it's a formula, just a plain formula using primed and unprimed variables that's uh, defined elsewhere. And that actually describes the value of the prime value of one variable in terms of the value of the other variables. And this, uh, oh, this notation, this is a record. A record is what's called a struct in C and it's called an object in most other languages. And it's a record with with two uh, type, with two fields called type, val, and val. And like the field of type has a value 2a and, and so on. And actually in mathematics, and since TLA plus is mathematics, uh, that's really just a, uh, some fancy syntax for this specifying of this, this record is simply a function whose domain is the set of strings type, val, and val. So this is all very simple mathematics with a little extra notation uh, tossed in. Uh, and unchanged is an, of, of f is an abbreviation for f prime equals f. So this is an abbreviation for this triple of variables primed is equal its unprimed version, which is the same thing that saying that uh, each of the a tuple remains unchanged if and only if each of its components remain unchanged. So that's a, an abbreviation for saying that max mal prime equals max bal, max v bal prime equals max v bal, and so on. So remember, there are four variables. Three of them are left unchanged, and the fourth one is its prime value is specified as a function of its unprime value by this action send. Uh, and the entire spec is about 40 lines. So, you know, it's a little, uh, you know, it's, it's a little hard to, you know, to see it in the first time, but it's simple math. You get used to it. And this is, in fact, the real heart of Paxos. And I've, you know, written, described it in prose a uh, number of times. And it's really hard to understand in prose. And once you, once you get familiar with this notation, uh, it's really a lot easier to understand this way than when written you know, in English with you know, some formulas thrown in. And the things to observe, it's all basic math, sets and functions. If you have to learn a little notation, and you've probably seen most of the, almost all the notation that you need in the, the slides that I've shown so far. It's not a great, a lot. Remember, people learn it in two weeks. Uh, it uses hierarchical, it performs hierarchical decomposition using definitions. Remember, next is defined in terms of those four sub-actions, phase 1a, phase 1b, and so on. You know, phase 2a was defined in terms of the subformula send. Mathematics has the most wonderful mechanism for hierarchical decomposition known to man, the definition. You may not have observed it, but if you've ever taken any math courses, you know, you'll start with some simple things and then you, you know, define other things in terms of them and other things in terms of them, and very quickly you're, you're dealing with some really heavy math. Just definitions. They're simple, well, it's, you know, it's basically a macro, and uh, it's really fantastic. You can also de decompose specs into multiple modules, but that's really done, rarely done in, in practice. Okay, wildfire. This is the initial predicate. Uh, there are seven variables, uh, some of them with, you know, complex variables. You know, this is an array uh, indexed by elements from address, uh, which... Uh, which each element A is mapped into this record, uh, and so on. Uh, this is the next state relation. Similarly, it's broken into 14 sub-actions. 
Uh, the full definition of next, you've seen the full definition of, of, of a knit, by the way. This is, whoops. Uh, there are no sub-definitions in there. That's, that's all of a knit. Uh, the uh, full definition of next with all of the sub-definitions, about 750 lines. Uh, this is a simplified version. The uh, spec of the actual wildfire protocol was 2,000 lines. Uh, and the high-level spec of what it was supposed to do was about 500 lines. By the way, that's about the lar as large as specs get, about 2,000 lines. Because when things get any bigger, a human being can't hold on to it all in, in his mind. And you've got to you know, break what you're doing up into smaller pieces or go to a higher level of abstraction uh, in order to cope with it. Uh, general, uh, not all, there are a couple of guys in research who did a I think in about an 8,000 line spec, which was very useful to them. Uh, maybe if a chance I could talk about it later. Uh, so, and it is always simple. The specification of liveness, which I didn't describe, generally I've never seen one more than about 20 lines. Uh, that 20 lines would be an unusually complicated uh, liveness specification, even for a 2,000 line, you know, specif you know uh, specification. And all the, essentially all the complexity is in the definition of next. And next is just ordinary math, no temporal logic or weird computer science math. And I'd love something that, you know, uh, and when my former Intel informant said that if he wants to know what a TLX plus expression means, just looks it up in a math book. That's in a real math book, not some computer scientist math, math book. Okay, this Pluscal algorithm language, it looks like a simple toy programming language. This is what the Euclid's algorithm uh, looks like in it. And the algorithm appears as a comment in a TLA plus module. Uh, for example, this is where M and N would be declared uh, in that module. And it's translated to a TLA plus spec that's put in the module. And the, the language is designed so that that TLA plus spec is really simple and you can understand it. And engineers, well, actually, if they're not sure what a TLA, what a plus cal construct looks like, means, they will look at the TLA plus code that it gets translated into, and that will explain, you know, exactly what it means. But it looks simple, you know, you know, tiny toy programming, you know, uh, pseudo code. But an expression can be any mathematical expression, which makes plus cal more expressive than anything any programming language designer has ever dreamed of. For example, uh, uh, probably not familiar enough with reading math to understand that, but this assertion says that, uh, basically that Fermat's last theorem is false. Uh, and so this plus cal statement is basically equivalent to a no-op. It says that if Fermat's last theorem is false, then do this assignment statement, but we know Fermat's theorem is true, so you never do the assignment statement. Uh, some engineers prefer pluscal to raw TLA plus. Uh, it's fine for specifying something like Paxos, uh, but it's not very good for real complex systems like wildfire because uh, you don't get the full power of mathematics or the full power of mathematical definitions if you're using uh, Paxos. But it can help you overcome your math phobia. Uh, and when I write algorithms now, you know, for publication, I write them in PlusCal because uh, you know, it's precise, it's completely formal, and computer scientists, you know, can learn to live with it. You know, I can explain very easily a couple of notations, and they'll be able to read the PlusCal uh, very easily, and it doesn't frighten them. Uh, so, what can you do with the TLA plus spec? Why well, write it? Well, you can debug it by model checking. Model checking means you check correctness of all possible behaviors for a small model. So for example, if you're writing, you know, designing a memory uh, chip, you know, uh, you know, for 64 processor uh, machine, well, you can't check it, you know, 
uh, gigabyte of memory and uh, you know, 64 processors, you probably check it with maybe two memory words and maybe three processors. You know, it sounds like you know, such a tiny thing. But it's incredibly effective. Much, 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 much better than testing. Because you're checking all possible behaviors of that model. And so you get to every, all those corner cases that testing you know, is very unlikely to get to. Uh, and, but how effective it is depends on uh, how large a model you can check. And that's very much a, a function of what your actual system is. Uh, you know, I can't tell you, oh, if you write a system this long, you know, it'll be able to do it. A specification, you know, in 430 lines, you'll be able to model check it, or in, but in 800 lines, you won't. It's, you know, sometimes, you know, they, the people at Intel model check 2,000 line specs, but sometimes I write an algorithm that's, you know, 20, 30 lines long that, uh, model checking, you can't model check it on a large enough model to uh, be able to uh, get very much confidence in its correctness. Uh, but for real problems, it, you know, it tends to, to work uh, that you have to uh, abstract away unnecessary details so you can do some effective model checking and that requires you know, some experience. You know, you can learn the language in a couple of weeks, but, you know, have to use it for a while, like any language, to really learn how to make the best use of it. So what else can you do with the spec? No, of, probably of no interest to anybody here, but you can write formal correctness proofs and check them mechanically. It's too hard or expensive for all but the most critical systems, although the people at Amazon have expressed some interest in trying to do it. Uh, I don't think it'll work for them. I think it's going to be too much work. But we'll see. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, for algorithms, which are you know, uh, much simpler than, you know, the, the, they don't have the, like Paxos is simpler than you know, an implementation of Paxos, which might take 10,000 lines or something, and it can be written in 40 lines. Algorithms, I can write and do, publish machine-checked uh, proofs. What kind of bugs uh, can TLA plus catch? Well, TLA plus can only check what are traditionally called correctness properties. And it's more precisely, it's a property that's true or false of an individual execution. That is, you can take a look at a sing an individual execution, possibly an infinite execution uh, of the system and say either yes, it satisfied the property or no, it didn't. And that's the class of properties that TLA plus can check. So for example, if the system never gives an incorrect response or the system eventually responds, that, those are things you can check. It can check something like the system usually responds to every input or that the expected time to respond is 37 milliseconds because you can't look at a single behavior and say what the expected time is or what the uh, or whether you know, it usually uh, does this. Uh, well, you can't tell things like average case behavior, but you can generally uh, check worst case behavior in principle because if worst case behavior is violated if there's a single behavior that violates it. Well, what about generating code? I have absolutely nothing to say about that. TLA plus is for modeling a system above the code level. It's for catching design errors, protocol errors, algorithm errors, before you start implementing. And I shouldn't have to tell you why you don't want to be fixing design errors when you're in, in your code. You know, codes, you know, people have you know, developed lots of really great tools for checking for coding errors. They suck at checking for algorithm errors. Uh, and, you know, so, I'm not telling you, know, you, you'll still need to check your code. That, you know, that it's, uh, but what you can do uh, is 
check for those things that you shouldn't, you don't want to have those errors that you don't want to find when you're coding. So why is formal specification a hard sell? Well, the common beliefs that I discussed. You know, engineers want tools to make their job easier. Well, I want to make their job harder if you consider their job is just measured by how many lines of code they produce. Uh, so it's easy to produce buggy software and it's hard to catch subtle bugs. So the current method of building software, you know, you draw some boxes and arrows on the board and then you start coding. Well, I want to add an extra step. You write and debug a spec. Uh, engineers want proof that this step is worth it. And I think that Amazon has provided this proof. You know, are other engineers, are, are you guys more sophisticated than those Amazon engineers? Remember that I wrote, Tom, Tim Rath, from the extensive fault injection testing and wrote detailed proofs of correctness. How many, how many of you guys have done that? <laughs> right, written detailed proofs of correctness. Amazon experience shows that other people, probably you guys, are building systems with serious flaws that could be eliminated by writing and checking formal specs. You know, uh, there's no magic bullet. Uh, specification is an abstract model of a system and checking it can catch errors that are hidden by the abstraction. Uh, writing a spec involves a trade-off between modeling the system accurately and hiding enough details to, perfect, to permit effective model checking. You know, and it requires experience to know where to go looking for those nasty bugs that, you, you know, that are really going to cost you and what details you can you know, safely abstract away. It takes practice. Uh, my you know, I'm, you know, my hidden agenda. For me, the model checker is the bait. Uh, most software engineers think at the code level. TLA plus forces you to rise above the code level and to think mathematically. And engineers who have done it report that this improves their thinking. And that helps them build better systems. Uh, TLA Plus taught me how to think, as a Microsoft engineer uh, wrote. Using simple math that I learned in high school, I found flaws in my programs that would have been next to impossible to debug on a live server and found them years earlier when we still had plenty of time to fix them. Okay, go to my homepage, click on the uh, TLA webpage uh, link to find out more about it. Thank you.